Him saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. He whom thou lovest is sick. Then in verse 5 it's repeated, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Get those two verses down. Verse 3 and verse 5. Jesus declared, first of all, they declared it, that he loved them. And then Jesus turned right around and says that he loved them. It was well known by his disciples and anyone close to Jesus that Martha and Mary and Lazarus were special people in his life. They entertained him at least two or three times in their homes, many, many more times. And we, they knew that he had a very intimate relationship with them. Not because they were special, but because they made him special when he came into Bethany. They reached out to him. They let him know, I want you. I need you. Lord, I want you to be in our presence. And I'm telling you, God likes us to be uh, to let him know how much we need him. But I'm here to let you know the devil would try to blind you to the fact that he cares about you, especially when you're desperate and you can't figure out what's going on. That is a lie from the pits of hell. Amen. Jesus Christ cares for you. <coughs> Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that? He loves us. He declares that he loves us. And uh you know how I know he loves us? He loves us because the Bible tells us that he loves us. But more than just that, the Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us and gave his life for us. Now we have that joy of knowing that. Mary and Martha did not know that at the time. He had not died on the cross. But we look back at the story and they had more cause to doubt. They had more cause to grief. They had more cause to be angry. They had more cause to wonder what in the world is he doing. We don't have that cause. Because no. we know the rest of the story. And we can look at that along with hundreds of other stories throughout the word of God and know that he does care. He does care. He declares it in his word. And there's nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or, or famine, or nakedness, or, 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 or peril, or sword? What can separate us, Paul said. He said, I am persuaded. This is Paul saying. And this guy had been through everything you can imagine, shipwrecks and stoning to death and, and uh, torture and imprisonment and you name it. But he said this in, in this lifetime, he says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 8 verses to the end, letting us know what a way in the chapter that lets us know, hallelujah, as long as we keep ourselves in Christ Jesus, nothing will power to hell. uncontrollably at his feet. Do you know what the Bible says he did? Huh? I started weeping. Shortest verse in the Bible, but the most powerful verse in the Bible to let us know Jesus wept. I'm sure he was saying, I don't even think he was thinking this. This is just, this is just natural for God. And I believe this, when you weep, he weeps. When you rejoice, he rejoices. God is in one with us in all these things that we go through in life. Jesus Christ found himself just weeping, weeping, demonstrating his love for Mary in such a powerful way. First of all, though, it says he groaned in his spirit in verse 33. Now we're groaned, that means, do you ever, do you ever, I do this, I used to do this a lot before I had this surgery, now I don't do it so much. <laughs> Do you ever 
Yeah. Weep so much, you snort. That's what that word means. He groaned. He, he snorted verbally, outwardly, outwardly. I mean, he was really being moved in his spirit when this happened. And there was a loud voice, an un, just a, a voice that was deeply, deeply agitated uh, as he listened to Mary's hurt and her grief. And he sensed the, he sensed the depth of her pain, and he was so moved that responded with a groan that was so verbal and vocal that I believe Mary could sense even the, the quivering in his body, because it went on to say in verse 33, and he was troubled, troubled, and uh, that, that means that the, that, that word in, 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 the, uh, in the Greek, talk, that word trouble carries with the thought of, of trembling, of shaking. Jared, Jared, Jared weeps so he's just shook. Yes. I, I, I held my wife and she's been going through tough times and we just held her because she was weeping so much and at a funeral or death or sudden tragedy. Do you ever see somebody just fall apart and you just yes. want to hold them? You want to hold them? They're so weak they can. Here's all of a sudden Mary's at his feet and what is he doing? He is trembling. She can feel the tremble in his feet. She can feel oh, the sorrow in his heart and the agony. Tell me, Jesus cares. Yeah. You hurt, he hurts. He sees deeper than you'll ever see. He understands more than you'll ever understand what you're going through in life. And don't you ever let the devil tell you that he doesn't care. King, he cares for us yeah. more than we care for ourselves. And God help us not to blame him, not to get angry with him. Even though Mary had to work through this in her life, I think I'm not counting her, uh, uh, holding her accountable for that because I believe she didn't know what we know. We have no excuse when we stand before God because we know the rest of the story. But I'm telling you, must have moved her when she felt the Savior weeping. Probably the tears falling on her head. She probably sensed it. When she looked up into his eyes, she saw eyes that were red, eyes of sorrow, eyes that were broken, eyes of care. And I'm telling you, the eyes of God when he looks down are not just glossy uh, eyes. Their eyes are fit with every situation that we're going in, uh, through in life. And when you look into the heavens and you see the eyes of God, those eyes will be exactly what you need in the moment you're going through the grief and sorrow that you're going through. Those eyes, if you meet up with Jesus, you'll know without a shadow of a doubt that he cares. And so in your dark moments, remember that Jesus not only came, but he called and he cared. He cares so much. And uh, not only does he care, he's... He, he, he's Got everything under control. Everything under control. That's why he says that we have a high priest that's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In all points, in every way, he says, therefore, bring it to the throne of grace. And our high priest that's in heaven, as you look into those heavens and see him, you'll see a God that cares about you and a God that can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And so when you hurt, he hurts. And what you're concerned about, he's concerned about. And don't you ever forget that. Bless of all, don't forget that in spite of all of this, and all of our doubts and fears and griefs and sorrows and questions and all that we have in life, God is in control. Yeah. In the darkest hours of Mary's life when she thought, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? When I need him, where is Jesus Christ? He was right where he needed to be. The Bible doesn't tell us what he was doing two miles away. And we don't know what happened those four days. We don't even know what was in the agenda. We just assumed that he was doing nothing. But I've never known Jesus to do nothing. Amen. So who knows what he was doing those four days? He might have raised up 20 other people. He might have healed 500 people. He might have done, who knows what he was doing? All I know is he was not wasting his time. Amen. God doesn't know how to waste time. Every moment is precious in God's eternity. And we have moments and hours and waste 
time constantly, but Jesus Christ never wasted one moment while he was on this earth. So I don't need to know what he was doing those four days. All I know is very important in the economy of God and in the eternity of God and all that God was doing. Maybe he was saving the Chris Fraggs. Maybe he was changing another life. Or maybe he was just teaching his disciples some important things they needed to know. Letting them know, hey, don't worry about anything. They were all pressing, hey, he's sick. He's sick. I said, he said, he, he's not sick. He's just asleep. And I says, oh, well, then let's not go bother him. He says, no, I mean, he's dead already. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. We really think we know a lot, don't we? <laughs> we really do. We're trying to, they were trying to tell Jesus, you need to do this, you need to do that. And they said, oh, well, if he's, if he's just sleeping, then it's okay. He said, no, he's not sick. He's dead. Well, it's kind of late to go now, isn't it? Is it ever too late for God? No, never. Is it ever too late for God? Never. 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 never, never. He's in control. I love that. I love it to know and believe in a God that created all of this. And if he created all of this, he can control all of this that we're in in this life. Amen. How Even unto death, he can control it all. And it's never over until God says it's over. Amen. Doctors can say it's over. I'm telling you, uh, situations can look like it's financially impossible. Everything can look like it's over in our life, and I'm telling you, in a matter of seconds, it all can be turned around by the power of God. Lord. I'm telling you, I've seen it happen too many times in my life. So let me not think for one second that God's got it under control. Oh, my God. <laughs> because God was wanting to teach not only Mary some lessons and Martha, but his disciples. And not only his disciples, I like that. Russ. Russ, since I said that, Russ is one. Yeah. He wanted to teach you and me yes. some lessons. Because it's going to happen. I got news for you 100% of us are going to die in this world. Right. You're facing it right now. You're facing it right now. And it could happen. And it's a reality. Whether we like to face or not, we've done a wonderful job. We're all going to face it. I almost faced six months ago. My mom had five cents put in her thing. I thought she's not going to come through this. I'm telling you, she after they only could put two cents in and had to go back and do the other three a few days later because she was so bad. And we had to sit and hold her leg down. She, my wife, my mother was really, really good with Jesus. She was in such agony. We had to hold her leg for eight hours and uh, could have been done. And she, Someone had to hold it down because they had to go through the, the leg to, to get up into her heart to do the stents and everything. It was just really, and she's 89, so you can tell that you know she had just been through the mill. This was terrible. And uh, so we all have to deal with this. And everyone deals with it a little differently. Whatever, but all I know is it's going to happen. We're going to go through work moments in life one way or another. Some of us have already been there, worked through it. I've been with you. I was with you in that room. I thought, she's not going to come through this. She's not going to play. Those are like zero. I mean, she was like gone. I mean, it was, it was like she, she was looking at a dead body there. She had no energy, life, nothing at all. And here's Tammy. God raised her. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. But that's why I believe God is in control. That's just one. I can tell you thousands of other times. Here. God just showed me. He's in control. We're going to be here until God doesn't want us to be here no more. When it's time for us to go, we're going to go. And if he wants to bring us back, he can bring us back. Hallelujah. Amen. He proved that with Lazarus. He said, hey, I have the final say. I am in control. And he wants to teach us, hallelujah, that we might learn about his purposes that he has for our life. And, and to understand uh, that when, when, when God is doing something, he might delay. He might put it off for four days. He might want to do something differently than the way we did. And that's why he didn't go there immediately. He wanted to let them see there's something bigger going on here than you can ever understand. A lot of times we think that all the world revolves around us and that our situation is the most important situation in the world. We don't know what was going on those other four days, but I'll guarantee you there was a lot of important things happening in the life of Jesus during those four days. And finally, when he got to knowing what he was going to do, he said, I gotta, I want to unfold all of my purposes to you that you might understand a little bit deeper the plans that God has for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He knew that Lazarus was already dead. He knew that wasn't taking him by surprise. 
He didn't. He knew he was sick before they even got the message to him that he was sick. I believe that. And I believe when they said he said he's weakening, he's going to die. Jesus knew the very second he died. And I got news for you. I believe he knows the very second Jack's going to die. And Jack don't even know it yet. But he's got his days numbered. That's right. Huh? How much more are you, Orlando? And look at me. I'm getting close. <laughs> I thought my number was a couple, three or four weeks ago. I thought, that's it. Bleeding to death. What a way to go. And you know, when I was bleeding like this, I was thinking, this is a, this would really be a nice way to go. <laughs> this is kind of, blood just kind of leaves your body. It's, this kind of warm flow down of life. Really, that's what's going through my mind. I said, this is, wouldn't be the worst way to die. This would be my, my rough with my wife, but I always heard me to death. That's a pretty good way to go. So I'm thinking, hey, this might be God working. And the funny thing is, like a week after all this happened, maybe two weeks after this, I was laying in bed, and uh, it was probably two weeks, because I wasn't in bed for two weeks. And uh, I was laying in bed, and I f fell asleep. I said, fellas, if I had this dream, I've never dreamed like this, ever in my life, I've never dreamed like this. I was laying on this field, and I began to rise. I just began to rise. It was so peaceful, it was so powerful. I just began to rise. And the field kept getting smaller and smaller, and I was rising. It was like I was just being caught away into the heavens. And then I was afraid to tell the dream to my wife. <laughs> So I didn't tell nobody until I got through this whole mess. Then what I got through is I thought, maybe God's trying to let me know. Get ready to go. I didn't know. Hey, have you ever been there? Some of you have. Some maybe yet. Someday you might be there, but it's a, it's a wonderful thing to know that God is in control. But in this purpose that he reveals to us, uh, he's also got a power he wants to demonstrate to us. A power. And in that purpose, I'd like to say that the purpose of God, I almost forgot to say this is the key point. The purpose of all of this is that God would be glorified. Hallelujah. Get this in your brain. Get it in your routine. Everything that happens in your life is for the divine purpose that God be glorified. Hallelujah. Don't ever forget that. It's, it's a mutable proof and, and truth in God's word that will never change. Everything that happens in our life is for a divine purpose that in the end of the whole game, God would be glorified. Even to raise disciples before he got these They don't understand what's going on, but this is that I might be glorified. They couldn't understand it. And that purpose was unfolding before them. They still didn't understand until Jesus went to the grave. They still didn't understand it. Martha thought, yes, he's going to rise at the, at the end of, of time and, and, and when you come back in your glory. And yes, he's going to rise. But no, 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 we have that faith. But right now, Lord, I, I just don't have faith in that can happen until Jesus to the tomb, and Jesus only said a, a, a few words, Lazarus! Oh, Power! Power! Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love, yeah. I love this. But probably the last word that Lazarus spoke on this earth was Jesus. I remember old sister Mauser died years ago. She was 99. I was at the nursing home and she passed away. And I was there. She was his great-grandmother. And uh, I was there at the bedside when she passed away. I don't know if you knew that. And when I was there with her, she was going, these were her last words. She was going, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's right there. 
I got to hear the last of Jesus. And I thought, maybe when Lazarus died, he was saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then, four days later, what's the first word that Lazarus heard in the grave? chapter 10. She didn't know she was going to reap it in chapter 11. And I'm telling you, if you build the practice of being at his feet, you're going to know exactly what to do when you're facing grief and sorrow and your life is turned upside down. You're going to come and fall before Jesus. And the sad thing about it is a lot of times Jesus is going to let things fall apart in our life to bring us back to his feet. Right. To bring us back to his feet. And he knows what he's doing and how he does it. I said, Lord, I just want to stay at your feet so that you don't have to turn my world upside down to get me to come back to it. Because then you feel so bad. If you ever neglect prayer and time, quiet time with God, then everything goes wrong and you realize, I haven't prayed with my wife in four days. I haven't done my devotion in four days. I haven't done what I'm supposed to do. And sometimes wait for some of you. It might be four weeks. Some of it might be four years. And everything goes wrong. <laughs> Back in 
1872, she wrote a little song she wrote in, I think it's maybe in our books. Tish, if you come right now, you're going to be, it's not the one I'm going to sing. I'm just, I'm not pretty sure it's in this hymn book. Turn your, in your hymn books to uh, the old hymn, I Need Thee. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. The rest of the verses God gave her, she wrote over 400 hymns. We don't know any of the other 400, but we, this one stuck. It stuck 147 years now. We have been singing this hymn. It stuck in the hearts of of this hymn book and many other hymn books around the world. You know why? Because the message is so real, so powerful, it's so simple, but it's so true. I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. He called her. But she had to come. He calls us, begs us, wants us, but we've got to come. And sometimes we're just too proud. We're too slow. I know people are being sick in this church. You'll be so sick, it's not funny. And I'll say, Can anyone come to need prayer? Let's pray. And no, you're sick and you don't come. I say, Okay, they want to be sick, let me be sick. I've been knowing they're going through crises in their marriage and you know they need prayers. So come, whatever you're going through in life, going through a dark moment, things are falling apart. Could you come and pray? Watch them sit back there and so say amen. You're out the door. They want to take my time in my office. They want to bring their cares to me, but they don't want to bring it to Jesus. Don't work that way with God. He calls us when we've got to come. Bring it to his feet. And when you do, it will move the hand of God and the heart of God. I promise you. Amen. So I don't know what you might be going through today or what you might go through tomorrow. All I know is you can be here. You better build that wall of defense against the enemy now by building a relationship with Jesus at his feet every day. Every day. See, Lord, I'm not taking a step today. I'm not getting involved. I'm not turning on that television. I'm not going to listen to the radio. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to get on my stupid cell phone. I'm not going to do anything. This is my time. That's why I tell people, don't call me before 9 o'clock unless you're a board member. Even then, sometimes. Don't call me because if I'm praying, I'm not going to answer the phone. In fact, I shut it off. So if I'm in prayer, if I'm reading the Bible, sometimes I leave it on because I'm listening to scriptures and whatnot, and it'll rain, and I'll see it rain. And this is important. I never answer. That's my time with Jesus. I'm at his feet. I'm not going to get up to do anything for anybody unless, unless I feel in my spirit that God wants me to. That's where I am. I need that time. And if I need that time, you need that time. You're not just spending a couple hours, but you need to take a little time. This morning I prayed with my wife before I left and tried to pray. And I uh, tried to pray with her every day. Sometimes I might miss one day. But, some, but sometimes my prayers are, you know, they're only, this prayer this morning was like one minute long. Oh, I'm around to pray. I said, Lord, be with her, touch her, heal her body, strengthen her. God, be with her, and help her get through this morning. 
this or service when I pray, many one will walk away from me. Most of us, we ever pray is five minutes. Most of us, ever, five minutes. But sometimes we pray 30 minutes. Depends on what crisis we're going through, how much we're going through. We always try to pray. But I have to pray first to Jesus. It's with Him first. He's the priority of my life. Then my partner. Then my kids. Then my church. It's an old song of life. You see this a few couple weeks ago. We brought it up on the internet tomorrow. Oh, yeah. During the Lord saying it. Some of you have been on Facebook. I think there were 27,000 hits on it. With just a matter of a couple hours. 27,000 hits when Derwin sang the song. Derwin's a good friend of ours from years ago back. And his buddy uh, uh, wrote the song. And Derwin, the first time I heard song, Derwin sung it. My wife remembered it. And I had heard it for a long time. We pulled it up. And, and man, you can go all over Facebook. Everybody's listening to it. It's amazing. And I uh, asked her if she could get it together for us today. And, and she came in this morning and said, yes. I know what you listen to these words. And as she sings these, if you really need me in your life, I would like you to symbolize that by just coming forward. You don't have to kneel. You just want to come and stand. But I'd love for my entire church just to take that little journey here to make a declaration. He's already declared to us that he cares about us. Amen. To come and say, Lord, I need you. If you want to kneel here, you want to just stand here. After we're all here, before we leave, Let's make a declaration to God. Sound booth and all, and everybody can come. Let's stand here and say, Lord, I need you. Listen to these words. Let's stand as the Lord impresses you. Move on out.
fifty times this last week. It's ingrained in my spirit and in my heart. I need you, Lord, like the stars need the dark the night. I need you like a man in darkness needs the light. I might start out on my own, but before the day is through, find yourself at the feet of Jesus. We're not done. Next week we're going to do the last one. At the feet of Jesus, I love you. I love you. Where she anoints his feet with oil and goes into worship like you would never believe it. This is after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Man, how her life and relationship with Jesus changed after that. That's the relationship we should have. Not one I want you, I need you, but one I love you. I love you. We're going to go to that next week I trust the Lord will bring us to that mood where we just want to worship Him. Oh. We're going to adore Him. We want to just give Him everything in our life and just pour out our soul to Him and worship and praise and say, Lord, You're my everything. You're my all. I love You. I love You. I love You. But this week, it's about I need You. How many need You? Would you raise your hand? You really need You. need You. Lord, with every hand raised and all these hearts, just surrender to You this morning. I thank you for this wonderful story that you gave to us, Lord, in the 11th chapter of John, filled with the power of the gospel. Almost every chapter showing us that you are the Lord God Almighty, the creator of all things. And Lord, the message of John is that you are God, you are God, and you are in control. So Lord, let us learn to look to you, to trust in you, and to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And to realize, Lord, that you have called us and commanded us to come to you and lean on you and trust in you, Lord. Help us to do that every day of our life. To bring all of our needs, all of our cares, all of our sorrows to you, Lord. All of our rejoicings, all of our praise, every good thing, every bad thing. To bring it to you every day at your feet and to let you know, Lord, our life is consumed with you and you alone. You're all I need. You're all I need. Jesus, you're all I need. God, help us to learn this. And not only to learn it, but to live this like Mary did. The Lord, we would see us every day, every day, at your feet. Lord, God, I'll thank you for that. I'll thank you for I'm gonna sing it one more time.
Thank you. 